Hello there. Welcome to History Chats this afternoon. Um, there we go. Hey, I'm Ben. Um, I'm doing the program today. Um, so this is, um, as this is going live, this is Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving if you're watching it um, on the day of. Uh, this is actually pre-recorded for me so that I can take the day off and spend it with some family. Um, so we're just gonna, you know, run through the program so that we still have some history. History waits for, well, waits for no one. Although it might have if I had realized that this is going to be Thanksgiving, but it's fine. We got a great program here. Um, so if someone is, you know, if you happen to just be watching this um, without having the, the context of what we'll be doing the last month, if you just, you know, clicked on it because it had John Muir, um, or you know, maybe you, you tune in every once in a while and haven't been paying attention. Well, the last month we have been looking at um, the neighborhoods of Wausau. Um, with the 150th anniversary of the city of Wausau, we felt like it was a nice way to wrap things up by talking about some of the different neighborhoods where, where people live. And, um, you know, often that is a, is a much more personal connection for people. And, and there's stories that we don't often get to talk about. So that was, a, you know, it's been a fun month of doing them. Now, when we, when we sit down, uh, you know, to, to, to plan out the month, you know, we have to decide, okay, Gary wants to do these topics, I want to do these topics, and then we kind of settle on the order. Um, we do that, you know, before the month starts, and, and I do a little bit of research to kind of get us, you know, an idea of what we're talking about, what we could be talking about, but um, in this case, um, I didn't necessarily en envision that this was going to be the direction this took. Um, my idea was... Uh, you know, why are we talking about a school, I guess is the, the subtext here, uh, when we're talking about neighborhoods? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, you know, there's there's a, a tendency for schools to be at the center of a neighborhood. Neighborhoods, the, the, the boundaries, as we've been seeing, are kind of hard to pin down sometimes. Different people, different times, uh, different generations might have different ideas about you know, where things are or what the dominant feature is. You know, is it based off of this street or that street or is it the park over there? Well, schools are one of those that everybody has in common. Um, and often schools are built, in particularly elementary schools in, in neighborhoods where there's a lot of people. Um, and that makes sense. So I thought, hey, there's probably some some analog here. Let's, let's look at this. I wanted to talk specifically, um, if we look at you know, so satellite view, um, here's Wassa. I figured, okay, well, Gary is talking about the near west side. We talked about that last week. Well, what about this stuff? What about the westward expansion? Because um, this is not, you know, all of these houses here were not there, uh, you know, back in the, the 1890s, right? So let's talk about this. And um, yeah, so I thought for a second, maybe I'd talk about like the, the move to 17th Avenue, kind of going out this far. But I settled on John Muir as being an interesting, you know, centerpiece. So, so, so let's let's. Well, I'll do my best. Uh, brief caveat here, just to say that uh, this one kind of got away from me as as the last month of doing research. You know, sometimes you lose track of the the core thesis of talking about neighborhoods. But that's all right. It's going to be an interesting story, um, and uh, hope you enjoy the journey that uh, we'll take you on here. I think it's important to start though with, um, you know, hey. The school, right? This is a rendering that was 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 made to kind of illustrate the plans. Um, the school itself was built in 18, uh, 1962 is when it's finished. Um, it was dedicated in February, um, and uh, it is a building that is unlike pretty much anything that we've seen in the city of Wassa up to this point. Um, it's certainly schools, right? Schools, uh, and and I'll show some other pictures of schools. They're they're up to this point. They're they're mostly like brick structures. They're you know they've got sort of gabled roofs and and chimneys and well maybe not chimneys, I guess sometimes, um, you know big glass windows that you can kind of get as much light in. Um, but these this this is a this is a modern building, right? This is a late fifties, early sixties. We're using aluminum and steel and glass. We've got a flat roof. We're going to use air conditioning and and heating. It's a central air to kind of move you know, climate control the building. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it, it looks very modernistic. It's got these right angles. It's got these, you know, the wings, the, the big auditorium, the central uh, round auditorium. You know, a lot of this is, 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 is kind of, you know, breaking the mold in terms of what a school is. Um, but, but yet, you know, it, it is an interesting, you know, despite the sort of uniqueness um, of John Muir uh, Middle School um, or, or junior high, 
I guess we should probably uh, sooner rather than later talk about that. Um, today, this would be considered a middle school, I think. Uh, traditionally, it, it was known by as a junior high school. And, and while today that has, you know, recently that has come to mean very specific things, a junior high school means these grades, a, a, a middle school has these grades, you know, whether that's, you know, just a sixth, seventh, eighth, does it go to ninth, does it start at fifth, you know, that has changed over the years. Uh, but but over the the since you know the time that that John Muir was was built, uh, middle school and, and junior high school could kind of be used interchangeably. So I will probably default to using both um, or one or the other. That's the, the deal there. But this is a one of whatever you want to call it. This is this is one of these these buildings that has a very interesting past, despite the sort of cutting edge aspect of the architecture. It has its roots in a really interesting story of the junior high school. And for this, we need to talk about, to understand what, how this comes to be, we got to understand this one. Well, not that deep, but this is the first junior high school in the United States. Um, and, and technically, this is a picture of a building. You can see this is kind of what buildings for schools had been built for, for, for years and would continue throughout the 20th century. Many, many of the early 20th century schools looked something like this. Um, this one is in Columbus, Ohio. Um, it's Indianola Junior High School. This is the first junior high in the country um, up until this point. It was a, you know, there were some people talking about the possibility of, you know, maybe um, we should have some sort of middle school between the high schools and the graded schools. Um, brief aside about how that all works. Uh, you know, you, on one hand, you have things like the, the one-room schoolhouse, right? The rural schools, small communities, where you might have one school teacher for the, the, the kids. It, early WASA schools are that way, right? Um, because there's only a handful of them, maybe a dozen or two. But as the city grows, and as many communities grow, you know, you have to try to figure out a better system for what, what are the responsibilities of the teachers and how many teachers are you going to have? Are you going to organize it? And so the graded system, which emerges in the 18, late 1800s, it becomes perfected uh, here in WASA in 1881, although they still tinker with it. Basically, the graded schools or graded grammar schools go from kindergarten through eighth grade, right? And then you go to high school. And in the graded schools, it's basically organized under this principle that you, you take a cohort of kids, kids that are about a year apart, you know, 12 to 13 year olds, 13 to 14 year olds, and you group them in their own grade or their own class. And at this point, everybody has gone through this. So this isn't, isn't unique, but this was kind of novel concept at the time. You know, that class then would continue and you might have a different teacher. Graded school meant that uh, instead of having one teacher for the entire con you know, uh, school, uh, or maybe two, you might have one per, or maybe even two or three per year for grade. Now, when we get to the high school, things change a little bit. I mean, part of the idea here is to try to lessen that shift. Because uh, one of the problems is, is that, you know, some of the, 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 the subjects that you teach at high school are not the same that you expect, you know, the um, junior, or, uh, you know, the elementary school kids to do, right? So we talk about, for example, imagine going to high school now and having a, a class with a teacher who is teaching, um, you know, pre-calculus or something like that. And then uh, the next session, they have to then go across uh, you know, the, the school to, to teach organic chemistry. And then they have to go and teach, you know, ancient Roman history or, you know, whatever. Like, those are kind of specific. So sometimes it helps to have that specific teacher just teaching math class, right? Um, now, the, the, the junior high school was kind of an idea of maybe some of these older kids, 13, 14, you know, years old, 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there, uh, maybe they could start to get introduced to some of these more advanced classes so that we don't have to do that. Um, there's also sort of a, a bit of a break. The department system, which was used in the, in the high schools, where, you know, you hire a math teacher to teach math, and that doesn't necessarily carry over from year to year. You don't have a new teacher teaching you math, but you also have a different teacher teaching you English or science, right? Um, that tends to, to lead to these, you know, departments. That's the name. So in 1909, Indianola is the first to kind of do this. And the intention is, well, maybe this will help this, you know, there's this group of kids, 
you know, what we would call seven, eighth grade, uh, maybe ninth, depending on how you want to look at it, maybe starting at fifth. But that sort of group of kids, they don't have as much socially or developmentally. They're, they're, they're different than kindergartners and first graders. But maybe they're not ready for high school. We don't want to throw them in with like 16, 17, 18 year olds uh, teaching, you know, learning Latin. So maybe we have this other school that kind of acclimates them to this new system. And so then they might, you know, for example, that might increase the, the number of people who stick through and get a you know, high school diploma while also providing a better education. So that's basically the background there. This concept becomes very popular. Like I said, 1909 um, makes waves. Here's this first one. Uh, by the next you know, five, six years, um, by 1915, there was an article that said um, there were, I think, 67 um, grade, uh, junior high schools in the country, in the United States, um, in 1915. And that number is just going to continue to grow as this idea catches on. It becomes a very trendy thing. And, and before long, people, the public is aware of these. It's not just something that educators, professionals are, are talking about. You know, uh, the superintendent of schools in Wassa, Silas B. Toby, is, is, is asked, what do you think about this, right? He goes to a convention, he comes back, and, and the reporters are like, what, did the, what do you think about the, the junior high school? It, Toby is a lot of things. He's a fascinating individual, and sometime we should probably go back and do a whole talk just about you know him. Uh, but he is not a fan of the junior high school. He thinks it's a waste. It's, it's, it's a waste of a building, and we don't really have a lot of room. Um, but explicitly he says, you know, that sort of departmental system where we have like just math teachers who teach math class. The problem with that is they tend to specialize. They only really see their students as math students, not as humans, as, as individuals, as, as kids. Um, and while that's, you know, acceptable when you get to like the high school level, yeah, sixth, seventh, eighth graders, these kids still need somebody who, you know, he, he says, you know, um, needs two, three, four different subjects to really understand what they need as, as, as students. Um, he also doesn't say this explicitly, and, and I should say he says this multiple times. Um, this is an article from 1916. He says it in 1915. You know, he's on the record, right? Eventually he'll change his mind, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, the explicit thing that he, you know, the un, or rather the, the implicit thing here, the thing that he doesn't say, but I think is a really contributing factor in this, is also, I don't know, it's new. We don't know if it's good or bad. There might be some good things. I don't see it. But also, maybe we need to let it happen for a while. Let's let some other school districts test it out and refine it, figure out what the appropriate information to teach these kids and the curriculum, and, you know, and then we'll, we'll come back and try to figure out um, if, if it works. But there's also that school thing, right? The schools are overcrowded. 1916, he is starting to consider, uh-oh, the city of Wausau is growing, right? Take, for example, uh, what was kind of his uh, hobby uh, project uh, is accused of being Humboldt School, and specifically what should come to replace it. Humboldt School is one of the older schools in Wausau. It was built in the 1870s, it looked like this. It was actually home to the high school classes before they built the dedicated high school. Um, and then it had become elementary, grade school, or graded school. But the problem is, is that the building, the, the population of Wassa, the student population of Wassa in the 1870s, was not anywhere near what it was growing to become in the new century. By the 1910, 20, or, you know, 1910, 11, 12 in there, it was clear that this is not a building that is going to be suited for the needs, especially located as one of the schools in downtown Wausau. Um, and so they start to try to make some plans. And ultimately what they suggest is, and I'm gonna flip the map here. Um, they had had it upside down. Now north is, is, is up. Um, this, by the way, is a 1912 Sanborn map, if you're curious. But the plan here is to say, all right, look, we need to replace this school. Why don't we buy up some of these houses nearby? We'll build a new structure. That way we don't have to, like, rehouse or, or you know, find other places for these kids. Then we can take this down and, and add more later. Or maybe buy up the whole block, right? So he takes this idea in 1917, um, actually earlier, 15, 14, 15, they're, you know, they're, they're talking about it. They finally get approval after a lot of back and forth. And so they build uh, what it becomes Central School. Um, now, many of you may know Central School as, as uh, the, the junior high school. Uh, some of you may know it as Horace Mann. 
Um, it doesn't actually get the name Horseman until um, John Muir is separated. Once we have two junior high schools, then they decide they need to give them names more consistent with like, you know, um, G.D. Jones and uh, Thomas Jefferson and, you know, Benjamin Franklin. You know, we got a, educators and, and prominent figures from American history. So that's where the name comes from. It's, it's quite the structure. It's a, it's a brick structure. It does end up taking up most of the block. How it comes to be is interesting. So originally it looks like this or close to it. I actually don't have a photograph of that first wave. So they do it in two phases. Um, this is a Sanborn map from 1923 with a 1931-32 uh, edition. And what that means is instead of doing a whole new map, they just papered over. You can see how Humboldt School is still visible, but then they just papered over it rather than, you know, print a whole new thing. So um, what this means is we can see when things change, right? So uh, we can see that there are still houses underneath what, you know, is going to become Humboldt School, right? But we can, we can see that this is the first phase. It kind of looks like this. Again, I don't have pictures or any further description of how it actually looked, but can just assume based off of seeing what's underneath um, as best I can. And phase two meant building all the rest of it. And ultimately, you know, they do. It's not an easy discussion, as as these things often are, right? Um, it's it's a lot of back and forth with the, the the funding people, but ultimately you have sort of this building where there's an auditorium in the center. There is uh, school uh, rooms, classrooms along the edges. Um, it would have been uh, three st two three stories in places. There's a basement. Um, many people may remember, maybe fondly, maybe not the um, the swimming pool, the the auditorium. I think is what they called it. Could be wrong on that. Um, in the basement. The f first floor was dedicated to the junior high school. Or sorry, the junior high school was the second the upper floors. The main floor was the, the grammar school, the, the grade school. And then the vocational school, the basement. You can see how it's, it's Central Public School, which is the name of the whole building, grade and vocational. And then they kind of add on here and junior high, which is interesting. It kind of indicates that maybe that was an addition to get this sold which I think is absolutely the case. I think Toby, he probably still had reservations, but he realized that if he wanted to get this building built, which as I said, is kind of a project of his, he needed to kind of broaden the appeal. And so by adding a vocational school and including finally in that junior high school, you know, it gets, gets built. Um, just a quick note here, you might be not familiar, you may not be familiar with the vocational school. It is an interesting concept. Um, in 1920, around this time, uh, Child labor is not gone. It's still happening. Um, it's, it's, it's better than it had been, you know, previous decades and, and generations. But uh, there were people, you know, 14, 15 working in factories full time. Uh, however, in order to do that, you had to get a waiver. You had to get like permission from your guardians and all of that. Um, and you still had to attend classes eight hours a week. Not every day but at least eight hours. And so the vocational school is kind of like a night school for, you know, working class minors, working minors. It's kind of interesting. That doesn't stick around. Um, initially, they didn't expect the junior high school to be around. It was supposed to be sort of like, we'll put it in here so we could get it built. And then in a couple of years, we'll build a new high school. But it does stick around. As I said, though, it is a difficult process trying to get the funding here. Um, it's interesting because throughout 1922, um, you see article after article every few weeks there, there's an article saying, Hey, good news. The, the, they're making progress. They, they, you know, they're not entirely sure. They weren't sure what the point was. You know, the, the school board came to the city council to say, Hey, we need funding. The city council said, why? What's the program? And then they said, here it is. And they say, are you sure that's what you need? And they said, yes, it, we do. We do need this. We've done studies, this is the best solution. And then they came back and said, well, you don't need us to like put bonds out, right? You can just pay for it for your budget. And no, no, we can't. That's why we're coming to you. And it just kind of goes back and forth. You know, have you, have you thought about trying to do this instead? Like, no, we have plans. Um, and ultimately uh, the PTA steps in, uh, the High School Parent Teacher Association and says, kind of gives them a nudge and says, this is something that's necessary. Uh, the, the community kind of gets behind it and, and we have it passed. Uh, the, I wouldn't say that this is atypical. I think this is probably very typical of these sort of, I mean, this is a lot of money. They're asking for like three, $400,000 in 1922. So yeah, it's a lot of money. Um, 
just kind of interesting to see that back and forth uh, keep happening. This is interesting, though. So in addition, remember how I said that they were going to, uh, you know, after a few years, they're going to build a new school uh, somewhere else. Well, they're already starting to make plans baked into these discussions. You may have noticed that this says by West Side Land. And if you keep reading it the, later in the article, it talks about how uh, the Educa Board of Education, the school board, uh, last evening uh, authorized the purchase of uh, $7,500 of 10 acres of land fronting on 12th Avenue, lying north of the west end of Marathon Park for the purpose of erecting thereon at some time in the sometime of a junior high school. It's interesting because, again, it's not a second high school. This is where the junior high school is going to be. It doesn't end up happening. I don't actually know whether or not this actually happens. Did they actually buy it or not? I think they might have. It's unclear. But let's talk about the West Side, right? Um, uh, Gary last week talked a lot about uh, the early West Side, the, the, the sort of early movement across the river and the early settlement um, the, as it developed in the new century, um, often around industrial sites, right? People walk to work, so you need to be living close to where you're working, right? So, um, and you can kind of see this. Uh, in red here, I've highlighted the, the main uh, concerns here. You've got like, you know, Crestline and Underwood and places down here. You've got um, Curtis and Yale and along there. Up here, by this is, by the way, 1955 is the name, is from this map. I've, I've oriented, obviously, so that we're looking west. So, Actually, here, let me put on the, the, the laser pointer. I don't know if this is easier to see, but this is downtown Wassa, right? Wisconsin River, so looking north, this is Marathon Park. So there we go. So up here, we've got like Marathon Electric coming in. Um, there's the railways. So there's some, some stuff around here, uh, Wassa Ironworks. Um, soon um, we'll see uh, Wassa Metals will move in here. Um, but it's a, you know, that's where it is. And and consequently, around those neighborhoods, it, you know, around those places, neighborhoods start to pop up. Um, and you can kind of see the, the schools attempt to try and uh, accommodate those. Um, so G.D. Jones up here, in the, or well, down here, I guess, in the south part of the, the west side. Um, I, I don't know if this is recently built, but I think there was an expansion here in the late 40s. Um, Thomas Jefferson is so new that on this map, they just call it public school. Um, yeah, uh, there's also, by the way, some, some Catholic and, and parochial schools in here, um, St. Anne's and, and, um, Newman just get built. So there's, there's more than just these, but, um, this kind of gives you an idea. So they're, they're kind of positioned around and decentralized to be closer to the kids. So in 1930, after a few years of the junior high school over at Central School down here, um, the state comes in and they say, hey, we're going to do a survey of the buildings. And they say, some good, some bad. You need to build a new high school, which they knew it was getting overcrowded, um, or at least add on to it, which is what they do. Um, but also, you really should consider building now, 1930, a second junior high school on the west side. Okay? Uh, of course, funding becomes problematic during the 1930s, what with the Great Depression, so we'll put a hold on that. World War II comes and goes, but, you know, okay, now... Late 40s, things are starting to get back on track where peacetime, people are, you know, uh, starting families that they've been putting off. There's the baby boom. By the 1950s, we're starting to look at this and go, uh oh, we're going to need more facilities for the schools because we have this, this group of kids who are now coming. They're getting to, you know, by the end of the 50s, we're going to see a huge number of them come of age that are going to need a junior high school. And the central school is not going to be big enough. And so the design, you know, junior high school on the west side, as they had wanted back in the day. Now, the question becomes, like, where is a good place for this? They end up putting it up here, outside of the city limits on this on this map. Um, you can see how the, the white space, um, this is where it goes. And is that a natural place for it? Did they envision, and this is one of the, the, the central concerns that I, I don't really have an answer for, did they envision that the neighborhood would just continue to grow around it? Maybe. This is what it looked like in 1922, back when they said, we're going to buy that land. This is the land that they were envisioning putting it on, which is crazy to think about. Um, this is uh, an aerial photograph taken by uh, Gustav de Beeren in, in, in a biplane, one of the first aerial photographs ever taken in Wausau. They were flying around the Marathon Park, which is kind of new at that point. 
Um, and so as they fly, it flew over on the corner here on, on Stewart and 17th, there is a um, carnival, spring carnival set up, uh, being set up for the Snap Brothers shows. And so he snaps a picture there. And you can see just how outside, I mean, if we were to turn around and look on the other side of the plane, we would see, you know, there's not a lot of houses underneath here. Um, this is very much at the edge of town. When, you know, we go back and look at this map, that white space doesn't just mean white space. It means like, there's not much out here, right? And yet, things change. Between 1922 and 1962, this area gets developed, and this then becomes the site. Now, I don't know if they put it here because they purchased the land way back or not, but ultimately that's what happens, right? Now, there's some developments here. So Reservoir Hill, um, that hill that kind of goes up on uh, in the 1950s, they build this big old res reservoir, which still is you know, a source of a lot of the drinking water for the city. Um, that neighborhood, uh, which I've also heard described as, as Dutch Hill and, and you know, some other things, but um, this is a Sanborn map from 1952. And you can see the, the round sort of blue here, that's, that's, the, that's the reservoir. Um, this is Stewart Avenue. And then this white space on the bottom left, that's where the school is going to go. And if we look at it, like even in 1952, a decade before the school gets built, you know, there's houses here, there's community, there's a neighborhood, but it's not as well developed as it could be and it will become. Um, so, and, and this is one of the, the concerns, you know, to tie it back to the neighborhood thing that we've been doing. I am not sure whether this neighborhood was, was moving west on its own, and so we put the school there, or, you know, that decision was made because the neighborhood was moving, right? Or if the neighborhood was moving there because they knew that there was gonna be a school there at some point. I, I honestly don't know. Maybe it's a chicken and the egg situation, maybe I'm just, you know, constructing that, but um, it's interesting to think about nonetheless. The other consideration, the reason that this actually does happen, is not just because the neighborhood is developing that helps. It's also a consideration that you have to think about where people are getting around. Uh, this is a, the, the roads, the major streets on the west side highlighted. I took some liberties and guesses about what was popular, but I, I know for certain that like 3rd Avenue is the main thoroughfare going up and down. You can see that it's one of the few streets that's completely you know, unhindered going up and down. Um, and to this day, it's kind of the, one of the main areas. Um, almost all the streets here are east, west, north, south, you know, cardinal directions. Um, there is Merrill Avenue, 51, which, you know, it's kind of important there coming off of 3rd Avenue. Um, there are some cross streets, right? So there's some western streets uh, coming off the bridges. Uh, Bridge Street here. You got Stewart Avenue, right, coming off the Clinton, and then it kind of, boop, goes around. And then um, Thomas Street. And then there's some other streets that, you know, arguably, like, I don't know, uh, 12th Avenue seems to be the end point. That's the city limits for a long time. So maybe that was kind of a nice straight shot that you could, you could drive down. Uh, but also you can't really drive down, can you? Because Marathon Park's in the way. And this creates a bit of an issue uh, for the traffic here. Uh, an issue that is going to get uh, more complicated with the, the changes in the late 50s. Um, this is a map, again, I've oriented it so we're looking west. This is from 1959, 1960, probably, let's say 1960. Um, and you can see here uh, the river. Uh, so so the, actually you can see the city limits are still, you know, we pumped out a little bit here around Marathon Park, but it's still, you know, ha hasn't really moved that far yet. Um, we'll get there. Um, but yeah, if we if we do the same thing, again, there's that, there's not a lot of straight shot through here. Uh, but once we push out so 17th Avenue becomes a place, that kind of, you know, fills that gap. Um, it also helps that the bypass goes through. Now 51, instead of going through Wausau, is going to go around Wausau and make it easier to, for people to travel. And then 29 is going to come in, right? And as 29 comes in, you know, there's going to be some changes there too. And and here, of course, this, this line, 17th Avenue, uh, right on one of the corners uh, the, the sides of the new school, that becomes sort of the Western travel point. So you got 3rd Avenue and you got 17th Avenue, um, kind of creating, you know, a convenient artery to get around. Uh, speaking of arteries, in the aftermath of that decision, as they decided in the 1950s to, to route traffic that way, uh, Wausau 
increasingly has to do with traffic. And so one of the things they do is they expand Stewart Avenue. So you can see on the left, this is before, it's just a two lane road. Um, and then in, in the mid sixties, they go through the effort to, to buy up and you know, expand the lane. Um, this is 1968, I believe. So um, they're not quite at the same point, but you get the idea. Um, and so here is, you know, the new John Muir. It's only a few years old at this point. You've got the Stewart Avenue and you've got 17th Avenue. And then just beyond that, you've got the highways, right? I don't know. It's interesting because I don't know in 1922 if, if there had been this much traffic, they would have seen this as a viable place for a school. But by the 1960s, yeah, people are getting around in cars. You know, maybe this actually helps drop kids off, you know, you know, on your way to work or what have you. It makes it easier for the buses to get in and out, having that main thoroughfare. Um, you know, it's just one of those interesting wrinkles that you, you know, have to consider as the city grows and changes. But, you know, again, here in 1968, 16, I think this is 68, 67, 68, 1968. I think this is 1968. Uh, I, there's a couple series of photographs. They like to fly over and, and, and take pictures of the progress. But so you got the bypass. Um, there's John Muir. Um, and uh, yeah, this does mean that, you know, even though there are houses out here, there are residential neighborhoods, it's not quite like some of those other schools where the neighborhood kind of encompasses and reaches around and, you know, gives that sort of embrace of the area uh, because 17th Avenue develops into a commercial, you know, district and because of the highway, um, it becomes a little bit, you know, different than what we'd see. But that's, you know, how things change. And of course, the neighborhood uh, certainly develops up on the hill. You know, there's the reservoir um, and, and, you know, becomes the community that we know today. And like I said, 1962, it gets finished after, after a number of years of, of planning through the late 50s and building 61 into 62. Um, it is complete. Um, it is one of those, it, like I said, it, it is a very modernistic building. It is very cutting edge uh, and sort of modern looking futuristic design in some ways. Um, it's early, uh, which unfortunately, you know, I've heard people say that, you know, it leaked almost immediately. And, um, and unfortunately, they kind of built a building for what they needed and not what they were going to need. Um, because as time goes on, the number of students continue to grow in the city. And, um, you know, by the 1970s, uh, from what I can tell, it, it's already, you know, having to, to juggle, okay, what grades go here? Maybe, maybe we hold off, you know, the sixth graders at the elementary schools before they come here just to make room. And, um, you know, that's going to be a, a continual thing that they, they juggle um, until the 1990s when they, they add on the addition here. So, uh, today, if we if we pull up the, the map and we look at John Muir Middle School, uh, we can see that this is not the same footprint that they built back in 1962. But, um, you know, that is the nature. Uh, the building has been around. The, the, commu the, the, the school has been in, in use since the 60s. And so, you know, you're going to have to modernize and, and add to the challenges, uh, to, to, to address the challenges of, of things as they grow. And so they did. And, and these days it is a middle school. I think it pretty much has been since, um, unless I'm completely missing things, but um, I just had a moment of, hmm, is it? Hmm? Maybe it's not? No, I think, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I guess I'll have to go back and edit this if I'm not, so I'm just going to say it is. Um, and yeah, it, it seems to have kind of settled in. Um, the, the city doesn't, the, 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 the school population doesn't seem to be growing like it was back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, so um, at least we're not running out of space in that regard. Although I'm sure that, you know, not a year goes by that there isn't some serious discussion about whether there's a better way to, you know, organize everything. But that's above my uh, ability to speak to. So, well, we'll maybe leave it here. Um, so that's that's the story of, of John Muir and, and kind of the neighborhood. Again, I, sometimes you start digging into it and it takes you in a direction that's not what you expected. But um, hopefully it was interesting um, nonetheless. Now, this is where I normally, I just kind of instinctively looked at the other monitor to see if there were any questions, uh, but this isn't live. Uh, this is pre-recorded. Um, so I'm not going to do that, but I will, uh, I guess I should talk about what's coming next. If you if you are continuing and are interested in maybe con joining us again for some more history, um, we, we do do a theme every month. This is the, the final one for November. So next week, we're going to start again in December. And uh, so, so we're doing um, kind of the, the history of Wausau and the five 
kind of dividing the city of, of Wassa's history, just to, again, bring us through uh, the, 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 the anniversary here. Here are five eras, and we're going to try to find a picture for each. This might need a little explanation. I'm just going to give it here. Uh, over the last year, we've worked, we've had the, the, the great opportunity to reach with, out to and, and had been reached out to us uh, by a lot of different organizations, you know, wanting to tell the history uh, of, their, of their, their business or of the, of the city of Wassa um, in some capacity this year, which has been amazing. Um, hopefully we can kind of keep that, that interest in the past going beyond uh, 150, nice round number. Um, but uh, as a consequence, uh, occasionally people have reached out to me um, and said, hey, could you, could you just send us like, uh, recently, I, I, I won't, I won't uh, explicitly name them, but one of the um, you know, news networks got back to me and they're like, hey, you know, we're doing a program. Could you just send, quick, just send us five images that represent the entirety of the history of Wassa? Just whatever, just, just five, uh, which turns out to be very difficult to do. Um, but we have been talking about the history of Wassa this year, and it, it's an interesting thing. And as Gary and I were, I would kind of mention this to him as we were, uh, as an aside, when we were figuring out what we're going to do next month and, you know, hmm, what, what would those be? What, what are the stories? What are the pictures that would represent this? So we're going to do our best. Some of these, I have some ideas of what, you know, might fit. Um, and so we're going to kind of, it might be one picture, it might be a couple pictures that represent what's been happening, telling the story. And, um, some of these, I don't know. I, I, I don't honestly know how you tell the story of the modern internet age uh, through photographs. It's not the same as talking about those early lumbering days. But, you know, we'll, we'll, that's part of the fun. It's part of the challenge. Um, so we'll, we're going to look at, you know, some of the photographs over the years and, and, and tell some stories from that. So that sounds interesting. Um, again, we're, we're, we do this every Thursday at 1230. And, um, yeah, love to have you, you come back and, you know. And, of course, as we look into the new year, um, I always... Uh, have the open invitation if you have any thoughts of subjects or themes or people you want us to talk about in the future you know don't feel free to, to let us know it's it's always helpful to get that feedback and you know takes a uh, little of the guesswork of what you want to hear away from us so we can just you know tell us so yeah if you have an idea please let us know um but yeah i think i'll i'll maybe call it there i've all right, 30, it, more, more time. I don't know what it is when I don't actually, even a virtual audience, uh, if I know that I'm doing a program for an audience, I have this internal, I've refined myself to stay, stay after 30 minutes. But for some reason, this program just keeps going over. Sorry about that. If you're, if you're still watching, I appreciate you uh, doing that. Hopefully it's worthwhile. Um, and uh, yeah, while I'm on the subject, thank you. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is going to be coming out on Thanksgiving. And um you know, very thankful that we have uh, people interested in history that tune in occasionally um, and enjoy this. It makes it worthwhile for as 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 somebody who puts these together and puts a lot of time in often um, to learning uh, about the community and telling a story. It, it makes it a, so much worthwhile when when I when I know that there are people that are enjoying it. So so if you are one of those people, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you. Um, and I, I know I speak from for Gary on this too. Um, it it, it make, means a lot. Um, so, so thank you for that, and I uh, hope you're having a wonderful or had a wonderful Thanksgiving um, as we get into the holiday season here, um, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the future and, and talking about some history, um, whatever that might bring. So have a wonderful day. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.